Ryan, what's on your radar? So the Virginia election last week was something of a collision of two different arguments that have been running in parallel the past several years in Democratic circles, and ones we've talked a lot about on this show. One is the question of how Democrats should position themselves in the ongoing culture war, with jockeying over fraught and contested concepts like wokeness and cancel culture. The other is the round and round debate over race or class. Are voters who flee Democrats motivated more by economic anxiety or racial resentment and eroding white privilege? But in the years since the debate has surged in earnest, Democrats have seen a steady erosion in support among working class voters of all races, while gaining support among the most highly educated voters. That movement would point toward class divisions driving voter behavior. But the rearing up of critical race theory as a central plank of the Republican Party in the last year appeared to throw the question open again. Maybe it's still race after all. But properly understanding how different voting blocs understand the terms of the debate, however, unlocks the contradiction. The culture war is not actually a proxy for race. It's a proxy for class. When people talk about the culture war, they're talking about class. Or, to put it more specifically, for some genuinely racist Republican base voters, the culture war and issues like critical race theory easily work as dog whistles calling them out to the polls. But for many working class voters, and not just white ones, it doesn't scan as racially coded in that way. And for them, critical race theory is in a basket with other cultural microaggressions directed at working people by the elites they see as running the Democratic Party. Take, for instance, one of the women in the focus group I talked about in my radar yesterday. When asked if Democrats share their cultural values, she said, quote, they fight for the right things and I usually vote for them, but they believe some crazy things. Sometimes I feel like if I don't know the right words for things, they think I'm a bigot. Now, the echoes of the busing wars in the 1970s and 80s are impossible not to hear in today's debate over CRT. And like with busing, Democratic elites are creating conflict within the working class while, protect, while protecting their own class and cultural interests. To step back briefly, by the early 1970s, white school districts had spent nearly two decades resisting Brown v. Board of Education, and attention had also turned to redlining and the dug-in segregation of housing. The 1968 Housing and Urban Development Act had banned residential segregation and empowered the federal government to use the force of law to put the policy into effect. In 1973, Donald Trump and his father were sued by the DOJ for racial segregation in their housing. That same year, a Gallup survey asked black residents to choose from a list of preferred solutions to school desegregation. And the top choice was the most intuitive, neighborhood integration and an end to redlining. Only 9% of black residents named busing as their preferred approach to school desegregation, which, again, is intuitive. Attending the neighborhood school is always preferable, all things being equal, than being bused somewhere else. But neighborhood integration would require white residents to give something up, while busing could be avoided by the well-off by sending their kids to private school. And so Democrats went with busing over housing. White parents who couldn't afford private schools still fled to the suburbs and began creating new school districts along racial lines. Since busing only happened within a school district, that meant it was largely going on inside big cities with the suburbs immune. White working class voters who remained in the cities noted rightly that the professional class in the suburbs, which proudly supported busing in the city, was merely signaling its own virtue while engaging in the same bigoted resistance to or avoidance of integration. Today's white Democratic elites, confronted with school systems that have substantially resegregated, persistent racial income and wealth gaps, and test scores that reflect those patent inequalities, they, the answer that they have offered has been to thoughtfully interrogate the concepts of white privilege and systemic racism and develop a new vocabulary that gives its speaker license to feel as good about things today as white folks did in the Boston suburbs in 1975. And that's it. The number one thing Democrats could do to shrink the racial wealth gap would be to do something about the estate tax and the many loopholes that allow wealth to continue to pile up in the hands of those who already have it. And in their giant Build Back Better Act, that was one of the first things on the chopping block. As Jamel Bowie writes in a new column in the New York Times, battles over language are by definition divorced from the material reality that structures inequality. He writes, 
We must remember that the problem of racism, of the denial of personhood, and of the differ differential exposure to exploitation and death will not be resolved by saying the right words or thinking the right thoughts. That's because racism does not survive in the main because of personal belief and prejudice. It survives because it is inscribed and re-inscribed by the relationships and dynamics that structure our society, from segregation and exclusion to inequality and the degradation of labor, unquote. Bowie answers with Martin Luther King's admonition to, quote, look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. He notes that King added, if democracy is to have breadth of meaning, it is necessary to adjust this inequity. It is not only moral, but it is also intelligent. We are wasting and degrading human life by clinging to archaic thinking. Now that's easier said than done, so Democrats prefer to say nice things rather than do good things. And Democrats are fine doing good things as long as it doesn't come at their own Right. expense or what they perceive as their expense because I would argue that they were that they were pushing against their own interests by digging in on white supremacy and digging in on segregation because I think that you have a fuller and they, they themselves would have led fuller and richer lives if they had not engaged in that in that hateful approach to desegregation but they thought at the time that they were protecting their material interests and, and their property values too I think they've also been taken in by a kind of um, anti, the anti-racism consultant class, mm -hmm. the Robin DiAngelo type people who are like, no, we, let me help you exercise this and we're going to work through it in a, like a sort of yoga sort of way. And you just have to, you know, spend, just write a check right. for a certain number of seminars, order a certain number of my books. And that's the strategy for fighting racism. Doesn't it entail you to do anyone, like they're, they're managing right. how to solve your racism. You manage it through these people. Right. And, and they've been, those people have you know, really gotten, they've gotten a boost, they've gotten a lot of media attention, and they've, they've kind of captured the conversation. Right, and usually if those administrators or elites are hiring these consultants and bringing them in, there was some spark. There was some genuine racial justice yep. issue that yep. occurred uh, that exposed deeper problems in that organization. And instead of dealing with those deeper issues, which might require actual consequences for the right. leadership <laughs> right. of those institutions that set that culture, they spend a bunch of money to bring in consultants who then tell the people below them that, that the actual problem is that they're not using the right words and, and that they, they don't understand their privilege or this, whatever they, you know, the, we, we all are familiar with this, the DEI, DEI curriculum uh, that, that, that uh, drives these trainings. And they do that, the same leadership remains in place, the same culture is able to remain in place. So not only are they uh, not solving a, a genuine problem that existed to begin with, uh, but they're, they're probably then dividing uh, right the then you create a new problem further. because then when that curriculum or DEI requirements become widely known a certain amount of perfectly reasonable people on all sides of the ideological spectrum look at it and go well this is bonkers right and then it becomes criticized and I mean that's kind of the little bit of the story of what's going on with the the right. rights um, capture of these issues or, or the right being able to use these issues in a very beneficial way to advance right. their and interests. It, and I think it, the, the Virginia election has at least uh, put some focus on this, and it has moved the conversation to, well, this is well-intentioned stuff that has gone wrong. Perhaps the people that created it were well-intentioned, but a lot of the administrators that are hiring these people, yeah. I would argue, are not well-intentioned. They are trying to cover up their yeah. own racial justice failures. Yeah. And and they they are the ones that need to be looked at more closely, yeah. ra rather rather than uh, the the people that they are trying to push through these. Some trainings. of these people need to just at every at in universities and corporations they're they're trying to justify their jobs, which cannot right. be justified because there's no well, reason there's for them, their jobs to exist. There's that too. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, Team Rising uh, joins us next.